حسبنا الله نعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النصير أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين سيما بقية الله العظم روحي وارواه العالمين له الفداء رب شره لصدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل لقطة من لساني يفقه قولي In speaking about life, subject that is important for all of us, every one of us individually is in need to know what life is in order to live it, in order to be successful in it. Most people, they go through life and they don't know how to live life and they just spend time. They never come to the realization of how they can be successful or in what ways are they failing? So when we look at life, we see that life is three dimensional. The first dimension of life is the length of life, which is how long you're going to live for. And that is forever. You're going to live forever. It's not going to end. This life is not going to be taken away from you. Allah gave it to you and he's going to keep it that way. And it's not going to go anywhere. So that's number one. The second thing is the height of life. The height of life is what we achieve from this world and what we become because whatever you are forever depends on what you have gained here, what you have made for yourself here. We have hadith from the Prophet that says, or from the Imams that say, that this is your farm. Whatever you sow here, you will reap in the hereafter. Whatever you make of yourself here is what you're going to see in your actual life, in the life that is coming. And your future depends on it. So our future depends on how we are in this life, what we do in this life, how much use we make of the life that we have. And this is why when Allah compares these two lives, now again, I don't want to say two lives, don't get the wrong idea that this is one life and that's another life there. And you know what? All of a sudden we'll have another life there. No, it's the same life, just in two parts, part one and part two. And in between is death. Now when Allah describes that and when he compares these two, he compares it with saying two things. He says that two things regarding the hereafter and in this life. He says that the akhirat is khairun wa abqa. It is better and it is lasting. Abqa means it's eternal, it's lasting, it's not going to end, it's not going to stop or finish. Can you imagine a life that's not where there's no ending to it? Can you imagine a life that you're living and you don't have to be afraid of ending? It's, you know, just imagine that. Wouldn't that be such a great experience to live life knowing that nothing is going to happen to you? You're not going to die or you're not going to finish. It's not going to come to a conclusion. And you're just living. Nothing can harm you. Such, my friends, is the amazing idea that Allah has given. And Allah made that for us. And it is a natural desire that we all have to live forever. And it is the truth. You're going to live forever. Allah says, Abqa. Then, khairun, better. The, the world there is better. In quality, it's better. In every aspect, it's better. And here he's speaking about the height. The height of life. What you make of yourself is a lot better there. 
So the length and the height, Allah describes these two in the Quran and says that there is a length which is forever and there is a height which is better. And better is left what? It's left ambiguous. Why is it left ambiguous? Because just use your imagination and see how high you can go. There's no limit. There's no limit to how high life is going to be. How high it is. How great it is. So one of the things that you need to imagine about your life is that it is amazing. It is amazing. Everything that you have there will be so magnificent and so marvelous that you will be in a complete state of ecstasy in the real sense of the word. A literal joy, a lasting joy knowing that it's not going to end. Do you want that or not? Yes. Why are we afraid of it? Why are we afraid of that? You know, a lot of times, you know, the reasons that we don't want it are so minute and so minuscule that it's funny. Why don't you want a life that is everlasting, that is joyful, that is amazing? What is the reason for that? And you will see that the reasons that we give are so minuscule. A lot of people don't believe in it. Life in the hereafter. Huh. And so, you know, I mean, simple as that. But the thing is that, okay, what are you sacrificing it for? This life? Are you sure you want to make that decision? Did you have a chance to analyze your life? And see if this is what you want? Is this really what you want? Look at it. Difficulties, trouble, suffering, pain, disease, and finally death. Ah, you know? And then, you know, I mean, on top of that, bills. Right? And if that wasn't enough, then you have Donald Trump as a president. And that itself is another whole heartache, you know? I mean, really, for a lot of people, it's like, you know, how do you tell our kids that that's our president? It's really embarrassing. It's really heartache for a lot of people. So now what happens is that when you look at it, this is this what you want? Is this really that something that your heart desires? Like, yes, this is what I wanted all my life. I wanted this and... You know, I'm here now. Great. I love this. You know, it's like, for example, you know, how many people who live in the ghetto want to get out of there? You know, let's say someone who's in the ghetto, which is the slums, right? Where the poor people live. They have no money and they're living in the slums. I don't know if you have ever been there, but I have for different reasons. I've been there. To look at the lives of people who are living in the slums. I'm not talking about India or Iraq. I'm talking about America. Right? People who live in their apartments, in the ghettos, in the hood. It's not a pretty sight. Really. Dying in their disease. There's really, I mean, I look at that and you feel sympathy. What is this life? I'm saying, if someone who lives in the ghetto says, you know what, I love this. This is what I wanted all my, I mean, this is what I was born for. Would you look at him and say, okay, you know, I mean, great, you should write a book about that and inspire other people. <laughs> Not to aim any higher. <laughs> you know, that might be a bestseller. <laughs> Because most people, unfortunately, are like that person. Most people are like that. They like this life. They are loving it. They love this world. And you look at it, 
said, why are we loving this? You know, and especially, for example, people who don't have dunya. You know, it's laughable. I can understand if someone who has dunya and is in the list of Forbes billionaires, you know, that you can look at him and says, oh, he has dunya. I'm sure he's happy with life and all these things, right? He did that. But those who don't have it, and whatever scraps that they have made in their life, they are so proud of that. And they want to live for that. It's amazing. You look at people and you're like, what are you living for? I mean, is this, are you happy with this? Really, we shouldn't be happy with this. It is deplorable. It is a disgusting life. This is not something to be happy with. There is a real life that is amazing. And it's the promise of Allah. He has made that promise. And it's a trust that we have. Yes. Did I see it? No, I didn't see it. Did you see it? No. And maybe that's why we're like, I don't know if it's going to happen. But I want to appeal to your intellect now. Not to your imagination, but to your intellect. Do you really think by reason... That all of this creation of yours and you bringing into life was really about this 70 years of living here and going through what you're going through. Is this the plan of your creation? Is this the plan of your creation? That's it. That's why, for example, a lot of people think that, oh, you know what? People who believe in the hereafter, they don't enjoy life. They don't enjoy life. Actually, they're mistaken. A person came to Imam Ali alayhi salam. Now let me bring Imam Ali in the conversation, right? He came to Imam Ali and he said that, you know what? Why do you believe in the hereafter? How do you know it's going to happen? How do you know that it's going to happen? There's a life there. How do you know that? Imam Ali, you know, didn't answer him. He said, he just asked him a question. He says, well, how do you know there isn't a hereafter? How do you know there isn't? Okay, let's look at it logically, right? There's only two scenarios. Either there is or there isn't, right? Either there is or there isn't. There's only two scenarios here, right? So now let's see. If there isn't a life hereafter, this is what Imam Ali is saying. That the way that I'm living my life is the best way to live here in this world. No problems, no loans, no headaches, no lenders running after me. I haven't done wrong to anyone. This is the best way of living this life. To live this life, this is the best way. So I am much happier than you are. You're enjoying and going through all kinds of headaches. Uh, you think you're enjoying, but you're going through all kinds of headaches in your life. But now let's see this. On the other hand, what if there is a hereafter? What if there is a hereafter? Now tell me who's messed up. You wake up there and then all of a sudden you see that, oh, there is a life. <laughs> there is life here. And then what happens? Oops. You lost the chance to make a life for yourself. Logically speaking, my friends, right? You lived the life here in the best way possible, and that is the life that Ahlul Bayt had led. They led that life. This is the best way of living this life. There's no other way. You know, everything that's loud, everything that's bright is harmful. Ask any doctor. Is loud noise good for you? It makes you deaf. Is bright light good for you? It makes you blind. <laughs> Try to look at the sun. I mean, look at it. Everything that's loud, everything that's... And what you think is a party is really harming you. It's harmful for you. What you think is a concert is harmful for you. It is harming you. This is not a good way of living a life. You're just harming yourself. 
But what's the right way of living a life? That's what we learn from Ahlul Bayt. In this life, this is the way to live it. Simple, good, not harming anyone, not lying to anyone, not deceiving anyone. Make sure that you are doing the best that you can to help others. In other words, in short, Imam Ali explained it in another way. Imam Ali explained it in another way. He said that when you are born, everyone is smiling and you are crying. Right? Isn't that right? You know, when you're born, you're the only one crying. Everyone is like, ah, he's born, you know. Mother, father, brothers and sisters, everyone is like happy, you know, clapping their hands and smiling and all these things. He says, but when you die, make sure that you're the one smiling and everyone is crying. Live a life here in this world, and this is the way to live a life. And when you die, that you are the only one smiling while everyone else is crying. It shows what you have done to others and the, the, the good that you have caused to others that is bringing tears in their eyes for you. You know, live a life like that. So that's the way of living a life here. That's how you live a life here. You don't, you know, make yourself go out of your way and do things that are obnoxious because that's only going to hurt yourself and it's going to hurt other people around you. So now, when you look at life, Allah compares these two and He says, listen, your real life, which is the one that's going to come after you die, is much better and it is everlasting. It's never going to end. The fashions there don't run out of fashion. But you have a life there. My friends, understand it. You have a life there. You have a house. You have neighbors. You have relationships. You have things to do. You have invitations to go to. You have guests coming over. You have everything there. All the life is there. That's where actual life is. And you will live it there. And then you will be like, wow, this is what I really wanted. And hence, first thing that we need to do is believe that we are going to live forever. Send us salawats. Now, concerning the height of life, just one point here and, you know, that will be all for today. And we will, inshallah, continue tomorrow. One point I'll make today regarding and concerning the height of life. That's what we are talking about. Let's send a loud salawat. You know, when you look at the height of life, it's what you make of yourself here in this world. One of the characteristics of life here is that Little things that you do here have huge consequences in the hereafter. You might think that what you're doing is small, but the effect of that little action of yours is huge in the hereafter, in that other life. When you are going to compare 70 years to eternity, you're also comparing the actions of yours in this world to the effects over there. So when you take a ratio, a proportion of 70 years to eternity, you will see that it is infinity uh, to <laughs> nothing, right? Now imagine this also. Even though it's irrelevant, but the actions of yours, the actions of yours that are here, that are so tiny and so minute, are huge, awesome in the life that is there to come. Send us salawat. So now let's see this, right? This is really what you need to think about. Everything that you do here, it might be small. But it has a huge effect there. Huge effect there. And you'll be just like that. One step here is worth billions of miles over there. You know, like for example, when you have uh, airline miles on your credit card, you know, some cards offer you times three. You know, three miles for every mile that you travel. 
And everyone is like running after those credit cards, right? Here Allah is saying that, listen, one mile here is worth a billion there. Can you believe that? This is the comparison between the two. Bring this into your mind right now. That's important for us to understand. A small step here is a huge thing there, and you will see the effect there. That is why it is said that one salawat here is worth a billion steps in the hereafter. And the louder you read it, the more you get. So what happens? Really, this is the idea. You do one small thing here and you have a huge thing there. Sometimes when you read amal and you do the amal and duas and you see the rewards of those duas, rewards of those actions, and sometimes you're amazed, oh my God, how much is he going to give? Allah says that if you do this, Jannah is for you. If you do this, you get this. And you're like, Allah, for just this much? Just this much and that's it? You give us Jannah? You wipe out all our sins? One tear for Imam Hussein and you're going to give us Jannat and guarantee it? Subhanallah. How come? He says, this is nothing. You know, you're just getting the entrance there. The entrance ticket is easy to get. Right? I have lots of ticket to give out to Jannat. Who wants to go to Jannat? It's being given out. Every time that we have Azadari, it's being given out. For free. Come on. Just shed a tear. Show emotion. And you see that. Subhanallah. This, my friends, when you look at that, that's what makes it. Small things here are huge over there. Imam Ali slept one night in the bed of Rasulullah. And Allah says that you are going to decide between heaven and hell. Imam Ali just struck one person and killed them. Out of the many he killed. This one he killed. And Allah says that this is worth more than the worship of all the creation. Worship of all of creation. How is that possible? Because one small thing here is worth a lot over there. Good things and bad things. And this is why when you do good things, you know, you know that the reward there is huge. And wait to be astonished by Allah. But when you do bad things and evil things, then the consequence is also great. The consequence is also great. It is there. You know? It's one of those things that we have to deal with. There's nothing, there's no way that we can turn away from that. You do one small thing and you see that the consequence there is amazing. It's huge. In the placement that you have, in the height that you have in Jannat. It's a huge consequence over there. Let me tell you one story. One story I'll share with you, right? And... This will help you to understand what I'm talking about. Very important, you know, that we need to see this. There are these three people who became shaheed, three students in the Hausa, who became shaheed. They were students. They're not alims, they're students in the Hausa. They went to the war and they became shaheed. And obviously, those who are shaheed go to Jannat, right? Their teacher, who was their trainer also, saw them, saw two of them, in the dream, two of them, and they were together. And they were happy, they were smiling. He says, how are you, and everything. He said, and they told him in his dream that, you know, we are, Allah has been truthful to his promise. Allah has been truthful to his promise that he has promised everlasting happiness and that's where we are right now. Completely satisfied, completely everything. So he was asking them and it says that we are, satisfied everything is right everything is good we gave our life for Allah and he has given much more than that a lot more than that so the teacher asked him where's the third one where's the third one 
He says, oh, the third one, he is way higher than us. He belongs to another stage. He belongs to another thing. We can't even see how great he is and where he is. Allah has given him that much. He says, but you three were the same. You are friends and you always used to hang out together and you always used to do things together and you became shaheed together. What happened that he ended up so high and you all didn't reach that high? You know, and they said, well, there was a moment of time when we were, we two, were attracted by the speaker. This speaker who was giving majalis. We were attracted by him. And our friend used to tell us that this person is not good. Don't listen to him. But we didn't pay attention. We said it's knowledge. We're going to go anyway. We're going to go there anyway. Because we're going there to learn. And just because of one. And then we understood that this person is not right. We left it. But that one month of ours became such a big difference here that he is so high and we are so low. This one moment of wrong things that we do here has huge consequences in our hereafter, in our real life. This is a relationship between this dunya and there. There's no way to deny that. Every small thing here counts, my friends. That's why the idea when a person realizes this and understands that every small thing of mine counts, everything that I do counts, this thinking that you have, that everything that you do here counts for my life, this is called taqwa. This is called taqwa. When a person understands his life and knows that everything here counts and he's careful of what he's doing here to make sure that it doesn't have a wrong effect in my life, this is what counts. This is called taqwa. And Imam Ali is Imam al-Muttaqeen. Imam of those who have taqwa. This is special. Oh, that's it. I will come to Imam Ali. And... This night, Imam Ali, you know, uh, really, he was someone who knew life, who understood life. And that's why you see that the things that he used to run towards, the things that he used to hasten towards, are different than the things that we hasten towards. And the things that he used to completely ignore and not even bother about, you see, are things that we run after. This is something special when it comes to Imam Ali. When you look at Imam Ali, he's like that. You know, when you look at him running towards what, what he used to run towards, you know, when you look at him in the battlefield, you'll see that he's running towards death. Without any care. He didn't wear an armor like others were. All the soldiers used to go there used to wear armor. He did not wear his armor. And they used to ask him, why aren't you wearing armor? It's to protect yourself. He says, it's the same for me whether death comes to me or I go towards death. Amazing, isn't it? I mean, look at Imam Ali. The way things that he used to run towards. You know, on this night... On this night, Imam Ali, well, you can say the morning because we have the night. This night, Imam Ali spent in the house of his daughter, Umm Kulthum. He came there to her house. Iftar, Umm Kulthum brought out the iftar in front of Imam Ali. Imam Ali never used to indulge in lots of food or anything like that. You know, very simple. He used to live as a leader, as a leader of the people, and as a leader of those who are poor also. It is only right that he does that and he did it to the best. No other example that we see that can be like that. 
And when Ummah Kulthum saw that Imam Ali is ailing, in the sense that, you know, they used to look at Imam Ali, he is growing old. He is not like his young self anymore. He is now becoming an old man. And when you become old, physically you start to ail. You see that you start to lose your physical attributes. And the daughters are concerned. They always encourage him, please, Father, eat something, eat something, do something. But there's something in his heart, something in his mind that doesn't allow him to eat, doesn't allow him to indulge. And on this night, Umay Kulsum brings about for her father, she brings about a glass of milk, date, and water. And Imam Ali looks at this and says to his daughter, he just looks at it in sort of agony and just tells his daughter, that tell me daughter, when did you ever see your father eat more than one thing at a time? Why are you putting these three things in front of me? So Umm Kulsum takes away the milk Imam Ali takes a date, eats it, and then after he eats it, then he goes and starts to walk around, and he goes for his sleep. He doesn't sleep a lot. After he prays, he goes to sleep, and then as he sleeps, he didn't sleep for long that night. Always Imam Ali's sleep used to be very light. He was never a heavy sleeper. He was light sleeper. The only time he slept heavily was in the bed of Rasulullah. <laughs> where nothing woke him up. But that night, Imam Ali woke up early. He woke up and seemed perturbed, excited. And he was walking around. He was walking around the courtyard and his daughter asked him, What happened, father? Why did you wake up so early? Why did you wake up in this way? He says, I saw your father. I saw your grandfather. Rasulullah came to me in my dream. Rasulullah came to me in my dream and said, Ali, it is time, Ali. Now it's time for you to join me. And since I saw him come in my dream and ask me to come to him, oh, I am excited. You see, Imam Ali was excited and he was walking around waiting for that time to come. It's as if he could not wait to get there to Rasulullah. And hence, now, if you look at this moment in life, what was Imam Ali seeing and what was he going through? When you look at Imam Ali, you will see that this moment of him Going from his house to the masjid is the sweetest walk that Imam Ali has taken in his life. Everyone is trying to stop him. Everyone is crying for him. When Imam Ali says, I am leaving to go to the masjid, his daughter is saying, something doesn't look like, please stay, do not go. Hassan will lead the prayer. <coughs> As he steps out of the house, his belt gets stuck in the doorway. His belt gets stuck in the doorway. And when that belt is stuck, he removes that belt as if the door is saying, Do not go, Ali. <laughs> Do not go. This is a faded night for you, a faded morning. And when you see that, uh, then there were ducks that were waiting there for Imam Ali that used to wait every morning for him at his door. When Imam Ali went out of the door, these ducks started to quack and they were making loud noises. And Imam Ali looked at them and says, even you want me to stop? But no, I am going to go forward now. This is the moment I've been waiting for. He went there with such excitement that he was going there and he did not want anyone to take any, any sort of sawab away from him, any sort of reward away from him. He went there, started waking people up. They were in the masjid. People used to sleep in the masjid. He started waking them up and he was waking them up and saying it's time for prayer, get up. Because people who sleep in the masjid and you wake them up it's sawab for you so when he was waking them up in the masjid he came towards one person he woke him up and the person he was already awake he was just looking up and Imam Ali looked at him he says I know what you're hiding there and I know what your intentions are I know what your intentions are I just wanted to see the face by who's going to make me meet my Rasul make me meet my brother 
Imam Ali came. And he himself gave the azan. And he himself gave the azan. And as he gave the azan, he stood there and went towards, he went towards the prayer mat. Jamaat was going to start, but this was the mustaha prayer Imam Ali was making. And he said, Allahu Akbar, and started making his prayer, the sunnat prayer of Fajr. He was making that. And as he made that prayer, and he went into ruku, that prayer that he was making was so sweet for Imam Ali, that he was just smiling there in the prayer, knowing that what's going to happen. And then when he went into sajda, the first sajda that he went into, Imam Ali asked, as soon as he went there, then someone came flying from the side with a sword that was opened, unsheathed, and the sword was poisoned. And that poisoned sword went up in the air. It's shown in Masjid al Kufa. Imam Ali's head is on the ground. That sword rises up in the air. Angels are crying and saying, Stop it, stop it, don't do this. Stop it, do not do this. And as the sword is coming down, Imam Ali's head is coming up from the sajda, the first sajda he made. Subhanaka Rabbi ala wa bihamde. And he rises from the sajda. As soon as he rises, the sword hits him on the head. The striking force of the sword makes a gashing wound in his head and his head is smashed to the ground. His head is smashed to the ground. Blood starting to pour from his head. Imam Ali now is on the ground. And as soon as people realize what happened, they start looking to see what's going on here. And the noise comes from the sky saying... The noise comes from the sky saying, Ali has been killed, Ali has been martyred. Ali has been martyred. The guidance, the pillars of guidance have been broken. And the noise goes through Kufa. Everyone starts rushing towards them. Imam Hassan comes there and sees Imam Ali, takes him up. By the time Imam Hussain took Imam Ali up to his lap, his face had become bloodied and his whole beard had become red with his blood. Imam Ali looks up at Hassan and Hassan's tears are flowing and he sees Hassan Hassan. Allah's promise is true, Hassan. When Hussein comes there, he sits at the feet of Imam Ali. He sits at the feet of Imam Ali, uncontrollably sobbing at his feet. Father kissing his feet and Imam Ali looks at Hussein Hussein do not cry Hussein I promise your mother not to make you cry say alamun ladheena zalamu ayyamun qalibin yan qalibun ya Mahmud bhaqi Muhammad ya Allah bhaqi Ali Ya Fatir al-Samawad bhaqi Fatima. Ya Muhsin bhaqi Hassan. Ya Qadim al-Hassan bhaqi Hussain. Wallah, give us a tawfiq to be on the right path. The wisdom to understand you guide us. Hasten the reappearance of our Imam. Make us his helper when he comes.